Grace to you and peace from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm pretty sure that most of you are familiar with some of the names that are a part of King David's life. David was the king of Israel, and this is not a test, but we'll just go through a couple of names here and see to it that um, we get these all down again. Would you answer it for me, please? We all know Goliath. That's the giant that David defeated when he was just a little boy. He had a slingshot and some stones and hit the giant in the head and killed him. He's the enemy of Israel. Uh, king Saul was king before David became king of Israel. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about him today. Jonathan, you remember? Jonathan was David's best friend. He was the son of King Saul, and he was killed in battle uh, at a pretty young age. Samuel was the prophet who had come to David when he was a young boy and anointed him and said, you are going to be the next king of Israel. Uriah was a soldier in, in uh, David's army. David was having a thing with Bathsheba. That was Uriah's wife. And he had Uriah killed and later on married Bathsheba. Absalom was David's oldest son. Solomon, we can say this with all confidence, was David's smartest son. Okay. Um, but today I want to introduce you to someone you probably or possibly haven't heard of. Again, I think we have, I may need help. Um, Asaph. Asaph was the lead singer, the, the chief singer of the temple choir. And that's obviously, pretty obviously, where David met him. Uh, he is responsible for writing the psalm we're using today as a sermon text, Psalm 73, and also the following ten psalms, maybe in corroboration with David, uh, who had written many other psalms. But these two would work together, and uh, they would come up with these psalms. So, now, I don't know a lot, I don't know anything about being a king. I know that they're on call 24 hours a day. But I don't think that they work 24 hours a day. Uh, they may not work 8 to 4, but um, they, they may have hours. But kings also have free time. And so, in his free time, David got together with Asaph, and we're going to imagine them today in one of the palace rooms working together on a song of praise, Psalm 73. And that's what we're looking at today. To start off, Asaph says to David, David, I've written a song, and I'd like you to hear it and then help me straighten out what needs straightening out. And David picks up his chalice of mead, and he's drinking it. He says, go ahead, play what you got, tell me what you've written, and we'll talk about it. And Asaph says, um, when I start, by the way, you've got to know that I was not in a good place. You'll figure that out when I'm reading you the lines from this first verse. There are three verses, the first one longer than the rest, but um, like I said, you'll figure out we're starting out not in a happy place. Here's the psalm. Psalm 73. But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold, for I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They have no struggles, their bodies are healthy and strong. They are free from common human burdens. They are not plagued with human ills. Therefore, pride is their necklace, and they clothe themselves with violence. From their callous hearts comes iniquity. Their evil imaginations have no limits. They scoff and speak malice. With arrogance they threaten oppression. This is what the wicked are like. Always free of care, they go on amassing wealth. So that's verse 1. Asaph turns to David. He says, what do you think? Is it too much? Did I come on too strong? And David says, wow. Wow. You caught my attention with your first line when you said, I was slipping away from God and almost lost my foothold. Friend, I am sorry that you were having such a bad day. But 
you know to come to God at such a time. And yet, you just listed a whole lot of reasons why you get upset with the way God treats the rich and the proud in our world. Do you mind, David says, if I tell you what I was thinking while you were singing there? He says, well, of course not. David says, well, here we go. You know, Asaph, that my life has been pretty well blessed. I've kind of had a charmed life. God has treated me well ever since I was young and blessed me. However, there were times in my life, like, you know, when I was asked to be a part of the king's court and play my harp for the king, I was greatly honored. I thought this was just the greatest thing in the world, to work in the palace with the king. But did I ever get invited to banquets or celebrations? No. You know when I was called? David, the king doesn't feel good. He's depressed. Bring your harp. Come and make him feel better. So I did. When I played my harp for the king and he felt better, did I get any thanks for doing that? Did I get any compliments on how well I had done? No. Instead, King Saul picked up his sword and tried to put it through my neck. There's another thing that's troubled me all my life. I have a best friend, Jonathan. He died in war when he was young, and I have never gotten over it. I've never forgotten it. I had... Um, I think about Jonathan every day. I do not understand why God took this fine young man out of this world at such a young age. And when he meant so much to me, he was such an important part of my life. You can forward a slide, please, too. Oh, one more. There we go. There's slides I'm talking about. Down in the bottom corner, there is Absalom. And Absalom was King David's oldest son. He said, you know what I can't get over, Asaph, is that my own son tried to overthrow my government and take over my position as king. I know that if he had the opportunity, he would have killed me. So my guards and my soldiers went out after my son Absalom to take him dead or alive. They brought him back to the palace dead. I felt so horrible that my son had died. And Asaph, right about where you're standing in this room, my general Joab stood there and he said to me, David, get over it. Quit grieving so much for your son. It's discouraging to your soldiers. How do you stop grieving for a dead child? David said, as blessed as I have been by God, there have been times when even I have questioned the wisdom of God in allowing certain things to happen in my life. There have been times when I have questioned whether God has forgotten me, forgotten about what I need, hasn't paid attention to what I'm thinking or how I feel. If God really knew what I was thinking, I think things would have been different. Asaph, with this song... I think you nail, you hit the nail on the head. Slide, please. This is how I felt. Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure. I have washed my hands in innocence. Because all day long I have been afflicted. And every morning brings new punishments. Now aside from David and Asaph. Most of you who have gone to church for a number of years have heard pastors say on different occasions, even though these words were written 2,500 years ago, they still apply to our generation. Certainly, seriously, don't we get frustrated when we hear about athletes, politicians, and Hollywood actors who get away with breaking the law? If they get caught... If they are convicted, doesn't it seem that quite often their punishments are way too light? Doesn't it upset us when we hear on the evening news that drug dealers, gang members who have caused indiscriminate harm in our world have gotten away with it, been released from jail, been released from the courts with no punishment at all? 
Aren't we tired of hearing about scammers who take advantage of trusting and naive people? They take advantage of them and get rich. So it certainly seems like this Old Testament psalm written that long ago by Asaph applies to people of our generation. Because we too sometimes ask the question, how can God allow such injustice? It just isn't fair. Asaph says, David, (laughs) David, calm down. Let me take you back to the refrain that I have written. Please. One more. This refrain I wanted to sing at the beginning of of the psalm and after every verse because it shows us just how much God cares about us, that he knows what we need, he provides what we need, and even when this life disappoints us, God's love for us is still constant. It'll still go on. So David, after all that frustration that I wrote in verse 1, after all that stuff Pastor Luck told the Shepherd of the Hills, Shepherd of the Hills group, listen to this refrain. Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. Let's change that word Israel, that name. Let's change it to his people. This makes it more personal. Surely it is God to his surely God is good to his people to those who are pure in heart that's you Let's go on to the second verse Asaph says I've got another verse I was so troubled by the situation around the world around me and when I came to the temple I knew that my heart was not thinking things that were pleasing to God and So I went to the temple, and I began to realize just how wrong my thinking had been. So this is what I wrote. When I tried to understand all this, it troubled me deeply, till I entered the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their final destiny. Surely, Lord, you place them on slippery ground. You cast them down to ruin. How suddenly they are destroyed, completely swept away by terrors. They are like a dream when one awakes. Okay, now this is how Asaph is describing somebody's life. Do you know how when you have a dream, just before you're waking up, and it's good or bad, but you think you're going to remember it so you can tell somebody what your dream is? You get out of bed, you have no clue what that dream was. It just fades away. Asaph says this is what it's like for those who, who are so unfair, for those who think they have everything going for them and have no trust in God. How could I have ever doubted God's love for me? My heart was nearly overwhelmed with grief. This is the God who gave me life. This is the God who brought me to faith through the Holy Spirit. He put me in a family who believed God's word and raised me up in the way that I should go. This is a God who ultimately promises to forgive all my sins through the Messiah, Jesus Christ. He didn't know the name Jesus had that name. Now he says, as I stood there in the temple, what God had declared about those who were disobedient became absolutely clear. First of all, their life is just temporary, like fleeting wind or passing dreams. Our lives in this world are only brief, and it's like Moses had said. Moses had written in Psalm 90, Our days may come to 70 years or 80 if we have the strength, and yet the best of those are nothing but trouble and sorrow. They quickly pass and fly away. I was talking to the kids about not feeling good, either feeling a little sick or sad, you could go to the temple if you were in David's realm. You could go to the, we don't have a temple where the presence of God is restricted to this one place. Because of Jesus Christ, we can come to God our Father, like I told the children, we can come to God the Father holding His hand any place and at any time. The writer to the book of Hebrews tried to describe that to the people of his day. And he tried to point out, we don't have an earthly temple anymore. When we come to God, 
we come into the presence of God and his holy kingdom. There we go. We got that one. You have come to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to the gathering of angels and the general assembly of those enthroned in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus. This is where we come, right to the gates of heaven, right to the presence of our Creator and our Savior. Asaph says, The wicked appear to be richly blessed, but their enjoyment is brief and only for this lifetime. Without faith in God and the Messiah, their eternity is nothing but shame and suffering. David, this time would you join me in singing my refrain. Surely God is good to his people, to those who are pure in heart. David, Asaph says, it's like my heart was cleansed. Then I was overwhelmed with the goodness of God. (laughs) So here's verse 3. He says, O Lord, I am always with you. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will take me into your glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? Earth has nothing I desire besides you. My heart and my flesh may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Those who are far from you will perish. You destroy all who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge. I will tell of all your deeds. David says, Asaph, this is gold. You've written a hit. People are going to be singing this song for generations to come like we did this morning. It's a wonder that believers have any doubts about our God or His love or His faithfulness. David said, I try to remind myself every morning what the prophet Jeremiah said. It is because of the Lord's great love that we are not consumed, for His compassions never fail. His mercies are new every morning. When we think about it, This really is a neat song, written such a long time ago. But we see the struggle of Old Testament believers waiting for that which is perfect to come. That's what we're doing. We're living in a world that is troubled with sin, sometimes seems complicated, sometimes overwhelms us with the evil that we see. But what are we waiting for? A kingdom where there are no more tears, no more suffering, no more pain, no more death. All these things have passed away. Just like Asaph, we are waiting for what is perfect to come. Have you been able to relate to Asaph's song, Psalm 73? As we look at the world and the people around us, Don't we sometimes find ourselves questioning the actions of God who seems to allow the wicked to prosper? Don't we sometimes feel that God has allowed earthly difficulties to almost overwhelm us? Then we come to God and we ask Him for help. But in the end, this is what happens. By God's gracious work and the the work of the Holy Spirit, and the faith we have gained through them, we realize that our daily lives are really about holding hands with God. And with David and Asaph, we can say, it is good for me to be near God. Holding his hand, no matter what the circumstances are in life, whether we're joyful, feeling a little sick, or dealing with sadness, we hold the hand of Jesus. And we can say, with David and Asaph and all who believe in God's grace that we know where to find comfort and strength, hope and blessing, forgiveness and eternal life. It comes through God's mercy in Christ Jesus. Would you join me? We'll change that word Israel once again to his people and we join in praising God. Surely God is good to his people to those who are pure in heart.
Amen.